Namaskar and welcome to In Focus. As preparations for election 1998 get underway, the election commissioner has kept away from the press and not given any formal interviews. But today, for the first time this year, he's prepared to break his silence and give his first interview of 1998 to In Focus. So today, Chief Election Commissioner M.S. Gill talks to us about the fundamental issues that lie behind his handling of the forthcoming elections. Mr. Gill, as I said, I want to talk about certain fundamental issues that lie behind the elections that you're organizing. To begin with, let's talk about the polling dates, which are spread out almost over three weeks. I think this becomes the longest drawn-out polling process in recent times. Why? No, it does not really, Karan. In fact, uh, it is almost the same as in 96. It's a three-day poll, basically, for the country, the 16th of February, the 22nd, and the 28th. There are only three seats in Kashmir, which are on the 7th of March, which take you another week further for compulsions, which are well known. And therefore, uh, the period and between the 16th and the 22nd or the third one, we give five days each because sadly, in this country now, even states like Goa want some kind of central forces. Everybody wants some central forces. And they need that much minimum travel time. So you're saying time. in a sense that the collapse of law and order has forced you to increase the time span between each polling day? Absolutely. When I did elections as a deputy commissioner, we did it with the Punjab police. And, now and everybody in India was proud to use the uh, you know, administrative and police systems. And that now you need the paramilitary state. and perhaps even the army. Well, we don't need the army. I am sure we don't need the army. But and paramilitary do. But, but uh, central paramilitary, everybody wants. Okay, and wants, in fact, so much of it that it's not really possible to give Let me much. come to the central concern why people are worried about such a spread out poll process. They say, and this has repeatedly been proved, that the longer the process, the greater the risk of someone tampering with the ballot boxes between yes, polling day and yes. counting day. That is why we are focusing on this. And we are trying to make sure, particularly in vulnerable states, that the ballot boxes will be washed from the moment the poll is over, sealed, taken immediately to a central treasury point, wherever they are to be stored for these two, three weeks. And they will be guarded by central forces. They will be escorted on the road by central forces. They will not, as in one state, there was a fear that they will spend the night in a police station. Ballot boxes have no reason ever to visit a police station, in my view. So will they always be in the custody of the election commission? Yes, absolutely. And yesterday, when I was talking to us and central observers who are going, I have told them that you will be watching those ballot boxes and you will accompany them so that we have to give confidence to the parties. It is unfortunate that for three weeks they have to hang about and wait for these boxes to be opened. Therefore, it is the duty of the Commission and all my staff, police and civil, to see that their confidence is upheld. But you know, traditionally in India, the political parties through their representatives keep a very strong vigil outside the strong rooms where the ballot yeah, boxes are yeah, kept. Yeah. Now, this time around, particularly in the case of the 130-odd constituencies that go to the poll on the 16th of February, they have to keep a three-week vigil. It's very difficult. I'm afraid it had to be done even in 96. But uh, what we do is, we do welcome, because there used to be in the past an idea that they can't follow the ballot boxes motor in a car behind them just to keep it in eyesight, or they can't do this or can't do that. Now we say no, they can do all that, because they've got to watch. In so they can to follow in cars exactly as they want, all of that you're giving permission. But they will have to find their party workers who keep on in relays hanging around there. But that I can't help because sadly India has come to this. Okay, there is somewhere where you can help and this arises out of the thought that you began this interview with that the last day of polling is only three constituencies yes. which for unavoidable reasons yes. have to be today. Yes. Therefore, can you in those circumstances accept a very common request from political parties to hold the counting early on the 1st of March for instance? Yes, I am aware that the Commission fixed the counting on the 8th of March after the polling finally finished on the 7th. We did it because that is the regulation and the law and we followed it. I have said before that we are a listening Commission and parties across the country have been speaking to us and the Commission will consider what they are saying. So you mean there is a serious chance that you will agree to holding the counting on the 1st of March? I cannot preempt the Commission's decisions. I simply say that we will be considering what the parties of India are saying. And when will we know the answer? Well, we are also aware of the time factors involved, and we don't sit on matters anyway. Let me put something to you. If you can agree to holding 
counting for two seats in Meghalaya on the 22nd, well before the results are out. Mm. Presumably, there's no great principle involved in holding the counting for all the other seats on the 1st of March. We did that after taking the unanimous agreement of the political parties on the 22nd and 23rd of December. And if December. you get a unanimous request for holding general counting early, will you agree also? I don't want to be pulled up by the election commission for talking out of turn. I only say the commission will consider what the parties are saying, but till the commission decides... And, we'll have a, and you've also said we'll have an early answer. Yes, I think so. Possibly within the next few days, because this is causing some tension and anxiety. Maybe. Okay, let's come then to another issue that's become a contentious issue. It is to do with the Election Commission's announcement that candidates who have been convicted, regardless of whether their conviction is under appeal, will be barred from standing. Do you intend to enforce that? It has already been enforced. We issued an order many months ago, and it was enforced, including the need for an affidavit to be filed in the Rajya Sabha elections to about five seats, three in Andhra, then one in Rajasthan. Can I interrupt Rajasthan. and put something to you? How do you counter the fact that people like Mr. Sangma, the former speaker, and even one or two leading lawyers have said that this requires a change in the law, that it's unconstitutional? Well, with great respect to the Honorable Speaker, I think it is Parliament, and he is the Speaker of Parliament, that made Section 8 of People's Representation Act 51 in, in perhaps 1951 or 52. And the Commission's duty is only to follow that section. And in you're the following past, the RPA in letter and spirit. Yes, in the past we had been lax. Okay, now it is clear in that section that there are three clauses of different offenses. And if you get a level of conviction in any of those, then the fact that you're on appeal or on bail is not relevant for purposes of a reasonable restriction on your standing for election. Let elections. me put something to you, Mr. Gill. If you ignore the appeal process, you could end up in a situation where a person who is eventually found to be innocent is debarred from standing. Now, that's not fair. No. It is something which Parliament, I think, in making that section has consciously done. And even the Supreme Court of India has held up a doctrine of reasonable restriction. In my reading of that section, all that that section has done is that while your individual rights for other purposes are there, until your appeal is finally settled, you won't go to jail. But it is reasonable to hold you back from fighting elections and becoming a member in a sacred place uh, if me. you have the first conviction. Forgive this me, is Gil their Sir. law. Forgive me, Gilsab. I'm actually questioning the reasonableness of what you're talking about. Let me put it like this. When an appeal, when a conviction goes into appeal, the sentence is an abeyance. The sentence is a punishment. Debarment from standing, disqualification from standing is also a form of punishment. So if the sentence is an abeyance, why shouldn't the disqualification be No, the sentence is not an abeyance, uh, unless the court specifically says so. The sentence is there, only the carrying out of that sentence is an abeyance. Tell me something. And this is very clear in the law. Incidentally, may I mention, that what we said has the support of numerous high court and even a Supreme Court judgment. But there are so several, we are not doing but there are several leading lawyers who contest this on the grounds that it's unfair. It's unfair because in equity, it suggests that a man has been found guilty and has paid a punishment when at the end of a procedure, he may be deemed to be innocent. What the lawyers should be saying is that Parliament should change this section because some lawyers think that would be more reasonable. It is for the lawyer to argue before the country and before Parliament. Let me put one other concern to you. People say that one of the most important fundamental rights in a democracy is the right to stand for elections. Now, you could end up in a position where a man who turns out to be innocent is debarred from standing because temporarily he has a conviction against him. If anybody thinks this is an unreasonable restriction, why don't they go to the Supreme Court? So why, why don't they challenge the section made by Parliament? Suppose they were to go to the Supreme Court, and suppose the Supreme Court were to find against you, wouldn't you end up being embarrassed? Not against me. If they find against the section, you're trying to make it the commission. I'm trying to tell you again and again that this is the law made by India's sovereign parliament in their wisdom and in their judgment and upheld by your courts as a reasonable restriction, which is a well-known doctrine in Indian law. But tell That's me something then. If you're so convinced that your interpretation of the law is the correct one, how come your predecessors who had the same powers didn't interpret the same law in the same way? I would prefer not to discuss that. Why? Because I just don't like discussing my predecessors. Are you implying that somehow they were less than rigorous in their interpretation? No, no, no. no. Each one does his best. 
Let me, put, that's what we are let me to put an explanation to you. Perhaps one reason why they didn't interpret the law in the same way is because they were aware of the fact that in a country like India, it's so easy to frame a person and bring a false conviction, and that your interpretation could end up inviting political rivals to frame their opponents as a way of debarring them from standing. If this is a reasonable fear, as we have been saying, Parliament, even otherwise we want this section to be improved, to be tightened up, and to be made uh, more easy to implement. Therefore, Parliament perfectly, the new one, has a right and maybe uh, a duty to look at it. But I think the worry in India, in fact, is the opposite. And that is that even if there is an FIR, the rate of conviction in India, the rate of conclusion of a case in India is practically nil. That Gil is the sad part of 50 years. Gilsab, you know the famous saying in law, that rather a hundred guilty men go free than one innocent man be found guilty. Now, in your case, you're bound to end up punishing several innocent people simply because you're enforcing a new interpretation that the previous commission never did. We are not forcing an interpretation. We are applying the law as made by Parliament as we are mandated and duty-bound to do. And it may not have been done. And if there is a concern, if people are listening to you, please let all of them in Parliament try and correct it. So to and I up, will obey the new law. So to sum up your position, it's roughly as follows. As long as the law exists as per the RPA the way it is today, you are going to enforce it as you've announced you will. Change the law, you'll change the enforcement. Absolutely. Okay, at that point, let's take a break. I want to come back in part two and talk about some new recent issues that you've raised, which I think haven't been quite as fully understood as they need to be. That's it for part one. We'll carry on with this discussion in just a couple of minutes. Don't go away. Welcome back to part two of our interview, the first ever this year with the Chief Election Commissioner, M.S. Gill. Gil Saab, I want to now talk about certain recent issues that have appeared and haven't perhaps been as understood as carefully as they need to be. I gather your new symbol order has the effect of not formally recognizing either the Rashtriya Janta Dal, that's Ladu Yadav's party, or the Rashtriya Janta Party, that's Shankar Singh Vaghela's party, as a proper formal party, whether national or regional. Am I right? Yes, I think our symbol order has large implications. Can you spell them out? Uh, the symbol order is, you know, from 1968. But in the past, the way it has uh, been applied and the way it has happened, uh, for example, people often tend to break away. And the moment they have so many MPs or MLAs, they would go across and they'd say, please recognize us. And they were recognized. It has happened to a number of parties immediately recognized. They got a symbol, state level or national level even. This time you haven't recognized either the RJD or the RJP? Yes. Now the commission in the case of the RJD of Bihar and, the, uh, and this uh, Gujarat RJP. party of Mr. Vaghela, uh, since it was a judicial case before us asking for the same privileges, we went very deep into it, the commission. And we found that uh, even in our own application, Sometimes we agreed and sometimes we didn't agree and there was no logic to it. We also came to a very clear view that if people walk away from a party and go somewhere else and then from there to a third place, they can't carry the mandate with them and they are not going to get the commission's recognition in future. And therefore, in the case of the Bihar party uh, and the Gujarat party, and the same applies to the Trinamul or any other groups that have come up, we have not given them the commission's recognition, either as national or even as state parties. As far as the commission is concerned, we have not given the recognition. But in view of our own confused decision making in the past, we have said one thing, that it would be reasonable and fair that for this election only, they would get an exclusive symbol as uh, Mr. Lalu Yadav's party has got but in But that's Bihar. simply as a facilitating measure for candidates to yes. stand on a common symbol. Precisely, it is a facilitating measure. They do not, for example, uh, get the time we have sanctioned on Doordarshan and radio to recognized parties because they are not recognized. Now, this is very important. You are saying that the RJD in Bihar, the RJP in Gujarat, the Trinamul Congress in Bengal do not and will not get any time on Doordarshan or All India Radio. They will not because they are not recognized by the Commission and the Commission's order is only for recognized parties. They will not even get 
free copies of the electoral rolls. It may be a small privilege, but it is a privilege we give to recognized let, parties. Let me just reiterate this, because I don't think people may have fully understood it. The RJP, the RJD, the Trinamool Congress are, in the eyes of the Election Commission, not regional parties, they are not national parties, and as a result, they will not get time on Doordarshan or AIR. That's yes, right. they have not been recognized yet. Now, the implication of this is that next time, in future, when parties want to break away from parent groups, they will not get immediate recognition, and therefore they may not even get the facilitation you've given this time of a common symbol. Is that right? Yes, next time we may not even uh, give the common symbol. This is only to get over our, our own past. And uh, what we are basically saying in those judgments is that if people walk away, as far as the commission is concerned, we only recognize them when in a next election they come back with their own vote mandate so in other or whatever words, they believe in. So in other words, when a party splits and a breakaway faction moves away, it will only be recognized after an election, not before an election. That's, that's so. This yes. is a very effective, strong anti-defection measure from the Commission, am I right? It is. It Did is you right. intend it as such? Oh yes, we agonized, we debated, all three commissioners are unanimous so this is conscious on this judgment. And this is and conscious, uh, deliberate policy from you? Absolutely, it's a unanimous decision of the three-member commission. We've talked very clearly about a strong anti-defection move that you've made. Let's now talk about something else that's of concern, exit polls. What is the Election Commission's view on the publication of exit polls based on the first day's voting before, say, the second, third or fourth day's voting has happened? Do you permit that or will you not permit it? Well, uh, you see, first of all, we did have a consultation with parties both on uh, opinion polls and exit polls. And uh, we got various viewpoints. We are examining this matter. For example, opinion polls. So you haven't decided firmly. We haven't yet decided, but we are very shortly going to say something on these. And is there a chance that you may ban the publication of what are called partial exit polls, i.e. based on the first day's voting but published before the second or third day's voting is held? Well, while our decision is still to be given, but I can point to what we did in 96. And in 96, we did not allow this kind of a thing in the middle of an election. An exit poll uh, at that time could be taken. But then it could only be exposed after the final day of voting. So you may impose the same regulation this time as well, although you haven't decided. We haven't decided. How quickly uh, will we have an answer? I think very soon, because we can't keep people hanging about. Okay, let me come to something else. Many people say, when they turn up at the polling booths to vote, that when the surveyors come to record their names for the rolls, they're always marked as present. When they actually turn up, they find their names are not there. Now, how do you explain this discrepancy? Well, you see, one of the major reforms needed, and we got to go on improving it, is the electoral role. The system has it all there. We had, over the last six months, a summary revision for the country. And in that system, for example, the Delhi administration here and the Haryana administration there, all their staff is supposed to go around and do this. But of course, over 50 years, our efficiency also has gone down. Motivation has gone down. So, so one badly. is that kind of a shortcoming. Second is even public apathy. This time, I advertised on Doordarshan radio in personal appeals. I wrote letters to all political party presidents again and again saying, party presidents, voters, candidates, concerned citizens, take an interest. Can I, can I, can I, take, take, an can I take an interest mm. and put to you something that's happened in my own locality? Yeah. People say, where I live, that's Parlamark, Basant Vihar, New Delhi, that this is not a result of accident, this is not a result of inefficiency. Sometimes this seems motivated. And the example they give is that often all the house owners are struck off when it comes to voting, all their employees are present. That also we are aware of and worried about because it just shows the functioning of government servants with the motivations they tend to develop. And you're going That's to why, let me give you a long-term solution we are trying to put across. We have ordered, we are already in the process, a number of states, Pondicherry, Chandigarh, Himachal, they have completed putting their new roles on computer CD-ROM. What I'm trying to do is, if we put them on computer disks, and they're widely distributed to all parties and candidates, whoever wants to look over them, and if they can go on checking them all the time, then perhaps there's a better chance of not having these kind of... You're saying easy accessibility is the okay. best form of scrutiny and security. Easy and continuous. Okay, let me then come to something else. You've been through, and perhaps at the moment you are still going through, a certain standoff with the press. I know it's not in your nature to ever not want to communicate, 
But to many people, this looks reminiscent of some of the relationships with the press that happened in the days of your predecessor. How do you think you've come to this position? This is absolutely wrong. Uh, I opened the commission, even when I was given the temporary job to uh, press access. I go on saying all over the country again and again that the press is my major observers for a good election. All that I believe in. I've always believed for 40 years. It's do you not rely a... on the press helping you? Yes, out. yes, yes. But uh, I think in doing a job like this, we have to have, what are we doing now? We have given every facility. There's a daily spokesman meeting them. We, I will also meet them. My colleagues will also meet them sometimes. But it is not possible for us to have total access all the time to every level, every officer. So We've got a big job to do, and people should also uh, consider what our necessities are. Can I, can I put to you what some members of the press have said occasionally? No, I, I, don't want to, I don't want to go into this debate, uh, please. I've said a bit, and even this I won't have. Okay, but are you hopeful that hereafter the relationship between the commission and the press will sort itself out and that there'll be understanding on both sides? Why should I be hopeful or dishopeful? I think we are doing the right thing. We've not done anything unreasonable. And the, incidentally, these are commission decisions. These are not guild decisions. You can fo focus me if you like, but that's not so. Okay. One other thing that came up, and now mercifully it's disappeared, was that in December the country felt that there were certain internal problems within the commission. They've got sorted out. What I'm looking for is a sort of confirmation from you. Are things back on an even keel? You know, this country and the press and you, sometimes you people have to go off the vyakti gut, the personality to the institution. This country does not believe in institution. The people always want to focus individuals. And believe me, even in our past, when Sheshan was chairman, none of you know the relationship the three of us had. And I know how positive it used to be. And the same has been, and it's more so, because we have a long relationship of four years whoever you're referring to. And I can assure you, well, the other day, all six of us had dinner intimately in one man's house out of the three. How do you think that happens? So therefore, <laughs> things are back on even keel. No, they are not back on even keel. They always are working. But I mean, those who want a story will go on trying to build it. Well, it's good luck. The what only reason I, I put this to you, Gil Saab, is that because the election commission during an election is so critical to the democracy of India, and because we look upon the three of you as providing the right guidance, it worries us when public disagreements begin to tear the commission, as it seems, apart. No, the commission will has been and will work as an institution, as a collective body, as a body with its democratic rights. I've always said I'm one third of the commission. I have no problem ever. If my colleagues decide something, I will absolutely carry it out to the best of my ability because I believe in a committee working. And I think all three of us do. People don't put, know this. Can I also put the opposite? Many people say, and they say this as admirer of yours, that through clever handling, both of policies within the commission and your fellow commissioners, you have found for yourself a supremacy within the commission, which, for instance, your predecessor looked for but never had. No, 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 that's not, that's, that's not true. You do not know how many decisions are taken where I am overruled or I give way. We've had a formulation, which once I remember putting to my, uh, our previous chairman. I said, you know, if you don't agree, we too are going to agree with you because I believe in a unanimous decision. And you still A good committee does not settle by voting. And there are, nobody knows how many times it's not my word that is carried. But we are happy with each other because it doesn't matter whose word carries. We do debate intensely and we debate hard. And that helps us reach a reasonably good decision. That's all I can say as a human being. And there's a central give and take between you so that there are no hard feelings on either side. No, no, no. There are right. no hard feelings. And we know each other for too long. And we are all graybeards now. I mean, nobody is going to see this kind of thing. And, well, they can keep on hoping. On that particular hmm. note, let's hope you set this controversy at rest. Thank you very much, Chief Election Commissioner, for giving us your first interview of this year and speaking so openly about these fundamental issues. That's it for this week. We'll be back next week with another interviewee. But for today, from the residence of Chief Election Commissioner M.S. Gill in New Delhi, goodbye.